Welcome to this week's view into the mirrors of history with Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. I'm Tom Navolis, your host. Today's topic is a fast study on the 17th Amendment and how the 19th and early 20th century churches in America were culpable in bringing its subversion to reality. But first, I want to thank Liberty Works Radio Network for hosting this program. Please check out all the other hosts on the network and then sign up and contribute as you can. All the Liberty Minded folks have a perspective on the 17th Amendment. We have heard over the last couple of weeks that the original intent of the framers of the Constitution was for the senators to be appointed by each state legislature, that the primary purpose of the Senate was to represent the state's interest as a sovereign republic in the national legislature. More importantly, we heard that those appointed to the Senate were to be individuals of high integrity, morality, virtue, wisdom, and aptitude. Before I get into the whole quagmire of the 17th Amendment, I'm compelled to rant for a while. Okay, ranting isn't quite the way this is going down because I'm going to keep the rant in the context of the framers during the various debates, Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers. Even more so, if I rant, it's going to be toward the transition of the Christian churches away from the foundational moral and cultural reality to a socialist and humanistic perspective that allowed the likes of the 17th Amendment to come into being. My historical perspective is not targeted at the made-up charges that the Senate became corrupt in the first part of the 20th century through the corruption of state legislatures. No! The historical perspective that I'm going to cover is this segment and maybe the whole program is the corruption of Christianity and the various denominations and their inability to maintain the moral guidance for self-governance and the national government. Hey Tom, this is an approach I don't think folks have ever taken. Isn't this going to confuse people? Where are you going to go with all of this? First off, let me get folks unconfused as to what the word rant is uh, all about by the use of a synonym that I like. The synonym is fulminate. This means to express vehement protest. My protest regarding the 17th Amendment begins with the Christian leadership that got off the foundational biblical reformation track in the mid-1800s and bought off on ideologies of utopianism and socialism instead of solid reformation theology. This nation began with its moral and cultural guidance set in the events and impact of the first great awakening. This was a revival and reformation movement that brought the citizenry back to a clear understanding of their fundamental relationship with the Creator and Savior, as well as their responsibility in self-governance and the expectations of any governing body within society. Just so you know, one of my many resources for this fulminate is the book Unholy Alliance by C. Greg Singer. I find it important to have people understand that as their understanding of Reformation biblical meaning goes, so goes their understanding of liberty and the purpose of government. What many do not understand, because of immoral manipulation of morality and the philosophical influences of all the isms, is the fact that that the Reformation distinctly investigated and explains how governance in general should function for the betterment of society. This period in history articulates how those placed in leadership and government should function as the dutiful servants of God first, then over those whom they have been confirmed to govern over. I'm not going into all of the specifics on what I just said. That is for a whole different discussion. What I am going to fume about is that the whole idea of what the framers of the states and the national constitutions understood had a clear view and a perspective of these very fundamentals that I mentioned. I know there are going to be a number of contrarians that will spout off about Hume and him being the primary source of constitutionalism and so on. But I'm here to tell you they are those that want their own way and are mental midgets that want to grant every excuse for their compromising moral libertarianism or worse, their socialistic humanism. Okay, enough of the truthful name-calling as sus domesticus asude, that meaning 
Calling a pig a pig. Why are you going to start with what happened in the 1800s, Tom? What we see happening at the turn of the 18th century is that the strong theological base of schools such as Harvard began to change away from their Puritan or strong Reformation moralism as the presidents of the universities were changing in their theology to lesser agreements with the root of that foundation laid in the 1600s. With that, we see that the institutions which were not only based on general education, but were in fact seminaries, began to become lax in establishing the moral base for governance. Even John Quincy Adams had to challenge his father, John Adams, who moved from his original congregational Puritan perspective to that of Unitarianism. Here was the first major shift when most of the congregational churches in New England turned into Unitarian strongholds. Sadly, the minds of men will reflect upon either the preached or implemented clerical bigotry instead of the fundamental truths of reformed biblical reality as it pertains to individuals in their relationship to God and then to society in general. It is interesting what John Adams wrote in 1809 in reference to a summation of his personal religious views. Quote, I will insist that the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. If I were an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the more essential instrument for the civilizing the nations. End quote. Now, this isn't a discussion about the Jews, but a point that the Old Testament in general defines social and political meaning, and it was the God of that testament that established it all. This, of course, goes to what you know, many of the Reformation teachers brought to the forefront, especially in the Scottish Reformation that then established the means of the English Revolution and the American Revolution against tyranny. With that quick backdrop, let's get to more of what happened in the 1800s that moved the moral needle from established Reformation principles to the other end of the register that is relativism through socialistic humanism. I do have to comment that the early Unitarians maintained the established moral principles of the Reformation until the mid-1800s, as we will see. And we will see that they were not the only large denomination that shifted from those core principles that then opened the floodgate to a false form of tolerance, which allowed for what I call the dumbing down of the citizenry in comparison to those revolutionary Americans. Let's start with this perspective from Singer that, in a very real sense, what has happened in the various large denominations, even modern churches, are expressions of religious and intellectual currents during the latter half of the 19th century. Singer states that, in fact, the failure to understand the theological background of the ecumenical movement has led many loyal Christians to embrace it as legitimate and even a necessary expression of the unity that all should embrace. The failure of many Christians to understand the true purpose lying behind the formation of the National and Federal Council of of churches has made it possible for them to cajole into supporting an organic unity and union of the various churches for purposes that are, for the most part, not only contrary to the gospel, but actually treasonable in nature to the historic message of the Christian church and even to the nation and American heritage. Wow! When I started digging into what was going on in the 1800s, not only regarding immigration, but the shift in social morality in business and governance, I was appalled to learn that these organizations were culpable in creating the mess due to shifting theological reasoning. To bring a brief moment of continuity to this, let me go back to something that I mentioned in a former program. I summarize the arguments of the Federalists to those of the Anti-Federalists as the Federalists expected the pastors and Christian church in general to maintain a moral and virtuous people so that men of solid morals, wisdom, and general virtue would be elected to the national government. 
Whereas the anti-federalists more more calculated in understanding the sinful nature of mankind, which caused them to argue for amendments that would further limit the national government because they did not believe that moral, virtuous, and wise men would always be elected to that national legislature. Hence, most every state had or still has a Bill of Rights in their constitutions, and it was expected by the Anti-Federalists that a strong, defined Bill of Rights should be included in the National Constitution. Back to what went squirrely in the mid-1800s. All the mixed bag of ecclesiastical activity was cranking up with theological currents that appeared in the country before 1860 and then gained a new status of influence after 1865. This was all inspired by the arrival of German idealism via Immanuel Kant, Hegel, and English Romanticism. This is when a new type of Unitarian thought emerged with transcendental contacts that were pantheistic rather than deistic, and thereby taking the farthest way of departure from historic Christian orthodoxy. Hey, even older Unitarian leaders looked on what horror of these new developments. Interestingly, even Ralph Waldo Emerson was forced to surrender his pulpit because of his open adherence to this more radical theology. Simply noted, Singer writes, Transcendentalism furnished the inspiration for most, if not all, of the reform movements that swept the nation after 1830. It had its most immediate and probably greatest impact in the abolitionist movement, which emerged after 1830. Although Transcendentalism lost its philosophical impetus after 1865, its zeal for reform lingered and found a new home and support in the evolutionary theories of the post-war era, being the Civil War. The socialism and communism inherent in abolitionism gained a new footing in the American mind and by the 1880s were gaining a wider support from both the discontented elements in society and the theological liberals who were espousing the social gospel and offering it as the panacea for every social ill. So this is all interesting from a Christian thinker like Singer, but what about some other reference? Okay, we have to step it up a little bit to get through all of this. So let's go to the communists themselves. Here's a collaboration right from the Marxist.org website. An article from A Brief History of Socialism in America, published in the Social Democratic Red Book, January 1900. The article starts out with, The history of socialism in America, using the word socialism to embrace the various steps by which the enemies of the present social system have sought to work toward a final deliverance, seems to divide itself into seven quite clear defined periods as follows. 1. The earliest period, embraced between the years 1777 and 1824, when the communistic ventures of the Shakers, Rappites, and the Zorites had the entire field to themselves. Then number 2. From 1825 to 1828, when Robert Owen made America the theater of his attempts to put his utopian dreams into practice by communistic experiments. 3. From 1841 to 1847, the period when Fourierism swept over the country as a craze, leading to the establishment of a great number of communities and phalanxes, all of them doomed to fail within a brief time. Number four, the period from 1847 to 1856, when Wilhelm Weitling was the moving spirit in trying to organize systematic socialist agitation. Number five, from 1857 to 1888. This period of time seems to have devoted to the effort of immigrant socialists, particularly from Germany, to spread the tenets of socialism, more particularly of the social democracy, but unfortunately without the Yankee ear. Number six, from 1888 to 1897. This period may be designated as that in which the gestation of socialism as native to American soil was going on. It began with the appearance of Gerland's book, The Cooperative Commonwealth, which was soon followed by Bellamy's Looking Backward. Number seven. 
from 1897 down to the present time, the period in which American socialism, having chipped the shell, first asserts itself as a force in American politics through the formation of the Social Democracy of America, the Socialist Labor Party, and by its transplanted methods having failed to reach the American ear. Tom, this is amazing information and from such a point of view that I had not heard in the Patriot circles, in the churches, or from academia. I can't wait to hear how all this ties into the move to subvert the framers' intent of the Senate through the 17th Amendment. Amendment. Welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalists got it right. This is Kathy Novolis joining with Tom, looking at a new approach to the discussion about the 17th Amendment. This is a listener-supported program hosted by Liberty Works Radio Network. I have to tell you, I have never heard anything like what Tom pointed out in the first segment regarding the shift in Christian theology toward the social gospel and then have all of this basically confirmed by a Marxist website. Tom, are you going to pick up where you left off? I believe it is critical that we pick up from the last segment and take the time to consider a biblical reality for modern times. Let's reflect on a premise from the last segment that John Adams made. He wrote, I will insist that the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. If I were an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. Again, I will note here that as one studies what happened in the historical accounts of the Old Testament, one is clear to understand that every time the Hebrews broke their covenant with God, which means breaking the moral and governmental creeds established in the Mosaic writings, their political, social, and economic fabric disintegrated. They ended up going from a dominant nation to slavery. It was only when they repented as a nation and re-acknowledged the living God that they were reinstated to their national sovereignty and prosperity. Picking up again what Singer was writing about the impact of shifting theology in the 1800s and a correlation to the transitory political and economic welfare of the Hebrews based on their theological and moral shifts, we hear if transcendentalism had a profound impact on social, economic, and political aspects of American life, it had an equally important influence on American theology. This newer and more radical form of Unitarianism renewed the attack on evangelical Christianity in a general and Calvinism in particular. Their hostility to Calvinism was epitomized in the book The One Hoss Shea by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Hey Tom, before you continue on your fulmination, can you remind everyone what transcendentalism is? Absolutely. Transcendentalism is a religious and philosophical movement that was developed during the late 1820s and 30s in the eastern regions of the United States as a protest against the general state of spirituality and, in particular, the state of intellectualism in Harvard University and the doctrine of the Unitarian Church as taught at Harvard Divinity School. Among the transcendentalist core beliefs was the inherent goodness of both people and nature. This humanistic philosophy is absolutely contrary to Orthodox Christianity as the founders understood from the Reformation. Transcendentalists believe that society and its institutions, particularly organized religion and political parties, ultimately corrupt the purity of the individual. They have faith that people are at their best when truly self-reliant and independent. It is only from such real individuals that true community could be formed. It is fundamentally composed of a variety of diverse sources, including Hindu texts, various religions, and German idealism. Let's just say that they don't believe in faith and believe that there are no empirical proofs regarding religion. So now we pick up with the reality that in this early third of the 1800s, we have a gross departure from the beliefs of our founders in the major denominations that were also shifting in their core theology from Reformation truths and principles. Singer notes this, 
there can be no doubt that transcendentalism had a permanent influence on nearly all of the established denominations. It also gave rise to new cults, which reflected even greater departures from the historic Christian faith. What is astonishing to me is that as I had to reflect on what was laid out by the socialist article in the 1900s regarding the forms of socialism in America at different periods, I recognize the correlation to the theological shifts happening during those periods and a kind of watershed in the constitution and political life of the nation. Singer puts it this way, the very forces that brought the great change in our political development also produced an even more important change of direction in the life of the very forces that brought the great change in our political development also produced an even more important change of direction in the life of most of the American denominations. Now, interesting to me is that this period referred to is from 1860 through 1876, and our Marxist writers note this period of time Time seems to have been devoted to the effort of immigrant socialists, particularly from Germany, to spread the tenets of socialism, more particularly of social democracy. It was during this period that the socialist Turner societies flourished. I will bring these Turner societies to light shortly. They were not the innocuous groups that many would like you to believe they were. When we take into account the transition of our fundamental doctrines from biblical reformation truths to the emergence of purely liberal, meaning secularized, theology, we can again match the timelines of what was happening in the various denominations to what was historically going on from their perspective, being the socialist. I'm going to give you that correlation now. First, we have the account of Singer regarding the period after 1865. He says, the reconstruction of the South, as over against President Andrew Johnson's programs of restoration, offered the first challenge to the radicals for application of the radicalism to the whole region. But beyond the reconstruction of the South, provided the radicals with a key to the reconstruction of the whole nation after their own basic concepts. The war, being the Civil War, had given them their golden opportunity to bring about a major revision of American life for which the reconstruction of the South was to be the prelude. It was their goal to recast all of American society in terms of a secularized philosophy. Radical reconstruction was therefore directed against not only the South, but the whole American constitutional and political tradition as well. It was undergirded and inspired by the theological liberalism and radicalism of transcendentalist era. And its principal aim was to replace the American Constitution and Republic with a democratic philosophy and form of government founded on egalitarian principles. The assault on the South as it was carried out under the Congressional Plan of Reconstruction, was designed to be the prelude to the reconstruction of the whole nation according to this radical formula. Political radicalism received a power stimulus from the post-war theological liberalism that flourished after 1870 and become the inspiration for the social gospel. The social gospel had its roots in the earlier movement known as the New England Theology, but it received a new character as a result of the impact of Darwinism on the American thought after 1870. Let's stop with what Singer had been telling us and look at the same period from the point of view of the Social Democracy Red Book of 1900. To begin, there were political problems in Germany in 1840 and America experienced a great influx of German immigrants. This allowed the founding of Turner Societies that were a continuation of the athletic societies in Germany, but many did not know the preponderance to socialism. I'm not going to quote directly from the article in the publication that came out of the publishing house of Eugene Debs. Quote, it is an interesting fact to socialists that all these early Turner organizations were avowedly socialistic. Their influence on the succeeding growth of the socialist movement in America is hard to estimate, for that growth was very slow. For years it seemed as if it would never take root among the Native Americans. 
the first Socialist Turner Vernon Convention was held in Philadelphia October 5, 1850. Several societies sent delegates among them to Baltimore, Boston, New York, Cincinnati, which were the strongest. The name American Gymnastic Union of North America was chosen, but this was changed the following year to the Socialistic Gymnast Union, and it had at that time 17 local societies with large membership. When the War of Rebellion, being the Civil War, broke out, most of the Turners went to the front to fight against Negro slavery. When the war was over, the Turner Society is reorganized as the North American Gymnast Union and ceased to be distinctively socialistic. In 1876, a socialistic Turner Society and Turn School existed in New York City, but it had no influence with the other societies of the country. Many of the old Turners have become Republicans as a legacy of the war, while others have become large employers and grown conservative by reasons of their changed class interest. In the spring of 1852, Joseph Widener, a friend of Karl Marx, began to disseminate the teaching of Karl Marx and Engels as set forth in the Communist Manifesto. In 1866, a Congress of National Labor Organizations was held in Baltimore, and a socialist delegate by the name of Schlegler, who was elected vice president of the Congress, made an unsuccessful effort to create a political labor party. In 1868, the National Labor Union, which had previously held aloof from politics, reconsidered the matter and formed the Labor Reform Party. The members of the Social Party did not wish to in any way obstruct this class-conscious action of the trade organizations and so ceased all agitation under their party name and gave the new movement all their strength. During all this time, the respectable people of the United States had increased their apprehension as to socialism and communism. The foreign news was full of lurid accounts of the new social terror, which the American capitalist editors took good care to supplement with denunciatory and foreboding editorials. This respectable element breathed a sigh of easier in 1870 when Judge Thomas Hughes, the Christian socialist and author of Tom Brown at Rugby and Tom Brown at Oxford, made a lecture tour through the country. Now, leaving that article, we can see a lot of things. And I will keep going more into the details from this communist article, but it is imperative to stop and consider the timing of Judge Hughes going around and speak. Now, Judge Hughes what is an English lawyer, judge, author, a member of parliament in the British cooperative movement and involvement with settlement in Tennessee reflecting his socialistic values. A committed social reformer, Hughes became involved in the Christian socialism movement led by Frederick Maurice, which he joined in 1848. So here was this gent from good old England lecturing in America, helping to alleviate the fears of socialism even in the churches. We have to finish this segment up with what Singer has written about 1870s period. He writes, The American mind was quite receptive to the new intellectual currents emanating from Europe. Darwinism gave a new motivation for the zeal of social reform. At the same time, for many churchmen, it had discredited the biblical account of creation to such an extent that biblical doctrine was no longer such a formidable obstacle to the realization of liberal dreams. With the aid of evolution, man could now exert his own sovereignty in the relation of his destiny on earth and the means that he would choose to achieve that destiny. Man was now sovereign, not God, and man would refashion his society according to the basic implications of this principle. With all of that, this change of thinking was contrary to our founders and framers as well as the ministers during the American Revolution. Things got to be really a mess even as Christian theology and evangelicals changed. The new theology was modified, bending to the new scientific naturalism, posing as humanism and democracy. I cannot say the summation for this period of time that was wrapping up in the 1800s better than Singer. He articulates that, once again, 
democracy sought to rewrite theology in terms of the sovereignty of man, many theological leaders were demanding a God who would cooperate with democracy and rejecting the God to whom they must submit. Darwinism and the rise of the democratic theology provided the fertile soil out of which would come the demand for Christian social action and an appropriate theology for the necessity of reinterpretation of the biblical message. My final comment to all of this is that it is a far removal from the New England battle cry during the revolution being no king but King Jesus. Now it is man as his own king in this period of time. I'm stunned at the parallel in the two points of view between the history of socialism written by a communist and the work of Singer about Christianity in America. They virtually say the same thing. Thing. Welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalists got it right. Just a reminder, Samuel Adams Returns is the subsidiary of the National Center for the Development of Constitutional Strategies, and this program is listener-supported here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Okay, now, I should not be surprised by what Tom is ranting about regarding the churches in America actually being a key component to the subversion of getting the 17th Amendment put into place. What I am now informed about is that there are two correlating ways to look at how we got into this mess that we're in. I hope that you're as excited as I am to hear how Tom brings this all together regarding what caused the 17th Amendment to come into play and how the citizenry ignored the real purpose of the Senate and Senators. All right, Tom, let's get that fulmination ripping. Thanks, Kathy. I have to qualify that I'm not really ranting. I'm looking deep into the mirror of history that reflects the differences between the source of true liberty and the heart of tyranny. As our founders and framers understood, the root of it all is a battle between Reformation biblical truths and principles against the man-contrived smoke and mirrors substituting for universal principles of God's sovereignty. I have to quote something that Samuel Adams wrote and spoke in August 1776 after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. He sets the tone that our nation was to look at only one sovereign being the living God of the Bible as set forth in the actions of the Reformation. Adams said, Our forefathers threw off the yoke of popery and religion for you is reserved the honor of leveling the popery and politics. They opened the Bible to all and maintained the capacity of every man to judge for himself in religion. Are we sufficient for the comprehension of the sublimest spiritual truths and unequal to material and temporal ones? Heaven hath trusted us with the management of things for eternity, and man denies us ability to judge of the present or to know from our feelings the experiences that will make us happy. You can discern, they say, objects distant and remote, but cannot perceive those within your grasp. Let us have the distribution of present goods, and cut out and manage as you please the interest of futurity. This day, I trust the reign of political Protestantism will commence. We have explored the temple of royalty and found that the idol we have bowed down to has eyes which see not, ears that hear not our prayers, and a heart like the nether millstone. We have this day restored the sovereign to whom alone men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven and with a propitious eye beholds his subjects assuming that freedom of thought and dignity of self-direction which he bestowed on them. From the rising to the setting of the sun, may his kingdom come. With that setting by Adams, let's get back to what Singer was historically establishing as the transition of Reformation theology to that of social gospel and its cause and effects in society and politics. What began to happen was that, as we discussed in the last segment, a shift to democratic social theology took exception to the strong creedal foundations within the denominations such as the Lutherans and Presbyterians, who held to the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Lutheran Osberg Confession. These core fundamentals of Christianity were seen as the formation of barriers between denominations. 
Now, all of this was happening in full force around 1887 through 1889. At the same time, there was another movement gaining great success in evangelical churches that were less creedal in their outlook. In Northern Baptist circles, as well as the Methodist and Congregational churches, there was a definite trend away from historic principles of Reformation theology toward what might be called a common denominator of doctrine. What this means for our discussion is, again, the view of who establishes moral context in a society equates to who then determines where rights come from and what democracy is over a constitutional republic. The new theology thinkers wanted to consolidate the denominations with a simplification of doctrine. Josiah Strong, a congregational minister, wanted closer cooperation between the major denominations and worked for over 12 years in building this alliance up until 1898. He was one of the founders of the Federal Council of Churches in 1908. Its so-called purpose was to enhance inter-church cooperation and relations. One of the first acts of the Federal Council of Churches in an attempt to secure religious instruction in public schools was to seek a close cooperation with the Religious Education Association and the National Education Association. But the council, most important business was the creation of the Committee of the Church and Modern Industry, which prepared the first pronouncement of the council known as the Social Creed of the Churches, which in my opinion, and verified in Singer's book, the real goal of the council was to organize all denominations under a common or organic unity. In the Organizational Conference of the Federal Council of Church in 1905, it was revealed that the fundamental purpose of the ecumenical gathering had deep-rooted concerns for political issues, temperance, and immigration. Thus, even before the Federal Council was fully formed, it was crystal clear that it would be an ecclesiastical pressure group in national and international political, social, and economic affairs. What comes to play now is direct Christian Socialism of Walter Rauschenbusch, who was a member of the former council, and together with George Heron and Harry F. Ward, they pressed into the churches of America the seeds of strict governmental regulation of all of life in the name of the gospel, and a socialism that was and is essentially communistic. In summation, Russian Bush and his cohorts placed a policy of deception into the churches in regards to Christian socialism by calling it the Christianization of the social order for the realization of the kingdom of God. Now, they avoided demanding the government ownership of railroads and other public utilities, but called for governmental control of various kinds of businesses that would bring about socialism that especially Russian Bush wanted. He was, in essence, an American Fabian, willing to uphold a policy of gradualism in his program of social and democratic revolution. I have to mention that Harry Ward is known to be a well-documented communist. In 1908, he was the founder of the oldest officially cited communist front group in America, the Methodist Federation for Social Action. Sadly, he taught at Union Theological Seminary and the Boston School of Theology, where he recruited and influenced many future pastors and theologians with the democratic socialistic gospel. Ward is best remembered as the first national chairman of the ACLU, leading the group from its creation in 1920 until his resignation in protest of the organization's decision to bar communist in 1940. Now, back to the correlation from the history of socialism in America. So here, in 1895, the Reverend W.D.P. Bliss organized an American Fabian Society in Boston. Social democracy is but another term for democratic socialism. In this sketch of the development of socialistic movement in America, we have seen first the utopian forms of socialism, communistic socialism, and finally 
in the Socialist Party, that being the Socialist Labor Party, a kind of socialism or rather socialistic propaganda in which a hierarchy ruled and which, besides uh, heresy hunting among its own members, instinctively stood for a socialistic state in which the administration of affairs would be bureaucratic. Such an administration would be quite apt to develop into a despotism. Presented in such a spirit, socialism had little attraction for the Yankee lovers of freedom, and so it had to make its way historically for a truly democratic type, for a party standing for social democracy. The party which had this mission to perform was formed during 1897, reconstructed the following year, and is today the leading socialistic party in the United States. Now, this article does not speak to anything beyond 1889 and changes its focus to a much greater furtherance of the socialistic players like Debs in the political maneuvering in every state in America at that time. Another interesting paper that is on the Marxist.org is about the Christian Socialist Fellowship. The synopsis is... Constitution of Christian Socialist Fellowship, adopted at the 4th General Conference, Toledo, Ohio, May 29, 1909. The new Constitution once again depicted the class struggle as a problem to be rectified rather than an immutable part of capitalism, expressing the object of the CSF as follows. To proclaim socialism to the churches and other religious organizations. To show the necessity of socialism to the complete triumph of Christianity. To end the class struggle by establishing industrial and political democracy. And to hasten the reign of justice and brotherhood, the kingdom of God on earth. Wow. I have to leave you thinking about this from Singer regarding the Federal Council of Churches and its first creed. He said, The social creed of 1908 seemingly was to confer it upon the government of the United States, and this federal government would be the agency by which the kingdom of God would come to earth at least on the American earth. This democratic philosophy is further reflected in the significant omission of any reference to those duties that men owe to their fellow men as unto God. Again, this builds to the breakdown of the foundational thinking when those promoting the shift to a democratic election of a senator come before the public. What we have been discussing is that breakdown of understanding of original intent for the republic. So now, let's take all that we have running around in our heads regarding transcendentalism and religious theological reform, the growth of socialism in America, and the timeline beginning in the 1800s, add that to the whispers and then the cries of these religious and political reformers having issues with sovereign states having the risk of potential corruption and the potential for electoral deadlocks as reasons for making the senator electable by the people. In other words, creating a pure democracy in America to which our founders were 100% against. Then we have it that the reformers introduced constitutional amendments in 1828, 1829, and 1855 with the Issues finally reaching ahead during the 1890s and 1900s. Progressives such as William Jennings Bryan called for reform to the way senators were chosen. Are you getting this? Do the math. 1828 from 1789 equals tick-tock, tick-tock, buzz! Did you get it? 39! Are you hearing this? 39 years from the ratification of the Constitution, the so-called reformers wanted to do what the anti-federalists predicted, have a consolidated national government. Listen closely. With all that was happening to debase our foundational Christian heritage, which set the fires of liberty alive, and the growth from utopianism to integrated socialism and communism, now hear this. By 1910, 31 state legislatures had passed motions calling for reform. By 1912, 239 political parties at both the state and national level had pledged some form of direct election, and 33 states had introduced the use of direct primaries with a campaign for a state-led constitutional amendment gaining strength and a fear that this would result in a runaway convention 
we're hearing that nonsense term again, the proposal to mandate direct elections for the Senate was finally introduced in Congress. It was passed by the Congress and on May 13, 1912, was submitted to the states for ratification. The bottom line is that all of this was fought for regarding liberty. All that our framers and founders argued over and worked to put in as protections for liberty, that which was put in place ended 124 years later by the slow and progressive work that, in my opinion, is rooted in the reality of what the Anti-Federalists argued and the demise of Reformation biblical truths and principles. If you want to return to the original intent intended constitutionalism, then you must first return to your original intent of biblical reformation. Next week, I'll introduce you to the segments from my seminar on the tale of two constitutions, the Anti-Federalists got it right, regarding the 17th Amendment and more. This is all an amazing twist that I had never considered. I'm wondering what it will take to return us to our Founders and Framers' original tent for biblical reformation and a constitutional republic. Thank you all for listening, and join us again on Liberty Works Radio Network for Samuel Adams Returns, The Anti-Federalists Got It Right. Got it right.